Hi guys, Mrs. Vance again, and this is the review for your final test of the school year. Our Unit 15 test is over biotechnology, as you know, and it will be given on your final exam day. Um, you do have a chance for bonus points, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. So, what's on the test? <clears throat> the test has 35 multiple choice questions and 5 true-false questions. The true-false questions are about evidence for a crime scene. Um, it sets up a scenario and has some questions about the, the about the evidence based on things we've been studying in this unit. <clears throat> for bonus points, um, you will get bonus points for turning in your completed review sheet. Uh, you haven't had a review sheet very often for tests, and this time you do, and so we're get, giving you bonus points for completing the, the review sheet. Uh, one a reminder <clears throat> about the test. Remember, this test is counting as a test, which is a double major grade, in the sixth six weeks. It will not count as your semester exam grade. Your semester exam grade will be your semester average, as it would be if you were exempting a final. Um, if you are choosing to exempt this test, then I will put in your six weeks average as your test grade for this, and the semester average will still be your semester exam grade. So let's go over the material that's coming on the test. One thing I want to point out, and we may not, I may not have said it exactly this way um, within the unit, but the big thing is that this, the ultimate source of all genetic uh, variation in all living things is mutation. All differences, whether it's a difference in skin color or eye color or uh, having dimples or not, all of those differences are due to mutations along the way. Mutations are not bad or not good, they just are differences. <clears throat> sometimes they end up being bad, sometimes they end up being good. Most of the time it doesn't make much difference one way or the other. Another question that is often asked about uh, genetic engineering and uh, biotechnology is why would you want to induce mutations? Well, one reason you might want to induce mutations in the population that you're working with would be to increase diversity in the population. In other words, let's, let's have some new characteristics. It gives you the chance to find new traits, identify desirable traits. Does it always work? No, of course not. But there is a good possibility of success. Uh, there may be some failures along the way, but, but definitely mutation is the source of genetic variation, whether you're breeding dogs or um, bacteria, whatever it happens to be. So we talked a lot about restriction enzymes, and there are several questions about restriction enzymes on tomorrow's, on the, on the test. Remember that strict restriction enzymes are naturally occurring enzymes that are, are found in bacteria. Um, they are, they find a particular sequence of DNA and cut the DNA in a certain way at that particular site. The restriction sequences, or the restriction sites, are always palindromes. Remember, a palindrome is the same forwards as backwards. So in the case of DNA palindrome, the uh, one <coughs> row of the DNA, one, one strand of the DNA might say G-A-A-T-T-C, and the other one would be C-T-T-A-A-G, um, but and when you match it up, they're the same backwards and forwards because of, because of complementary base pairs. Some restriction sites produce sticky ends when the enzyme cuts there. That leaves groups of unpaired bases at one end, and others produce blunt ends without unpaired bases at the end. Um, you see some examples here <clears throat> of some of the restriction enzymes. You are not expected to know specific restriction enzymes, but you should be able to recognize a restriction enzyme, and you should be able to figure out where it might need to cut to produce sticky ends of a certain size. Uh, sticky ends can be, um, you know, two, three, four bases <clears throat> long. I haven't really seen any more than that. There may be. I don't really know. Uh, but the ones that we've worked, talked about more, most of all, have, uh, have you know, two, three, or four sticky end, uh, sticky unpaired bases at the end of a sticky end. Some others, like this one, like HAE3 and SMA1, um, cut with blunt ends. Those would not necess they would be useful for cutting the DNA into pieces for DNA analysis, but they would not be useful for um, inserting a gene into a plasmid or something like that. <clears throat> Speaking of electrophoresis, okay, what does that do? Remember that the whole purpose behind electrophoresis is to separate DNA fragments, or any molecules really, um, by size and by charge. 
uh, DNA fragments are negatively charged. So therefore, when the electric current is flowing through the gel, they're going to move toward the positive pole, being repelled by the negative electrons. The smaller fragments, <clears throat> the smaller pieces, smaller molecules are going to move farther and faster. And then, then the groups of fragments of the same size or similar close sizes are going to form bands on the gel to indicate that that, that particular uh, pattern or that particular profile, the DNA profile. The DNA profile is called, also called the DNA fingerprint. And those are, you know, unique to individuals. So here's how electrophoresis works. Just as a re reminder, we're put, going to put our samples, our specimens in uh, wells at one end of the gel. When the electricity uh, flows through the gel, it's going to cause the fragments to move through the gel. Again, the smaller fragments are going to move faster, <clears throat> and, this, and the longer one, uh, larger ones are going to move more slowly. And so you end up with a pattern of bands of pieces of DNA of the same size or similar sizes. So why is this important? Well, it lets us uh, identify similarities and differences in the genomes of different organisms or different individuals. It lets us study specific genes. It lets us identify um, how closely related or how, uh, how, many, how distantly related organisms are to each other and so forth. There are lots of different um, applications of this. PCR is another method that is often used with restriction analysis. That's remember the PCR is kind of like the Xerox machine for, for DNA. It increases the size of a DNA sample in, in, uh, by multiplying, making copies over and over again. Uh, <clears throat> this is useful when you have a very small sample and you need more of it. Um, and it lets you see a, a, the pa banding pattern more easily. Um, the, both of those processes are used a lot in transformation and in genetic engineering. Transformation is when you put new genes into a cell via DNA, via DNA from some other source. In bacteria, we often put the DNA in a plasmid. Remember that bacteria easily pick up plasmids in their environment. And that allows us to um, <clears throat> engineer bacteria that will do certain tasks that we want them to do. So what would be the advantage of putting a human gene into a bacteria? Well, it lets us make a large quantity of human proteins much more easily than it would be just harvesting them from individual people. Genetic engineering involves reading and editing DNA sequences and then reinserting DNA into living organisms. And so sometimes the plasmids that we, in, that we put into um, a bacteria would be something that was engineered. Um, sometimes it would be the, the gene might be changed a little bit or something like that to, for a particular purpose. So how do we produce a transgenic organism? <clears throat> Remember, you take the uh, plasmid from the bacterium, and you're going to cut the plasmid with a particular uh, restriction enzyme. This particular example shows ECOR1. That's the one that cuts at GAATTC. Our foreign DNA... <clears throat> Uh, or our, has that, that has our gene of interest, we're going to cut with the same restriction enzyme on both ends of it. And then we put those together with the, with the plasmid that has been cut. Then the DNA uh, will hybridize into the plasmid, and DNA ligase will be used to kind of attach the ends together. And that produces a recombinant plasmid, which they, we can then insert into a bacterial cell and then grow the bacteria in culture to make lots of copies of the bacteria that will make whatever the gene of interest happens to be. So in cloning, we're making genetically identical copies of either a gene or an organism. And we talked specifically about the cloning of Dolly, uh, Dolly the sheep that was cloned in the late 1990s in Scotland. Prior to, the, prior to Dolly being cloned, a lot of scientists thought that it would be very difficult or if not impossible to clone um, a new organism from a differentiated somatic cell, a body cell. Up until that point, it had really been most successful done with undifferentiated embryonic cells. Um, but the scientists who worked with Dolly and, and who have done, who have cloned animals since then have learned some techniques to help cause those um, somatic cells, those body cells, fully differentiated cells, to become less differentiated so that they would be acceptable uh, to and, and would, would actually work to clone a new organism. So here's a uh, 
outline basically of how we do somatic cell tra nuclear transfer. So here's our body cell with our desired genes that we want. We'll take the nucleus from that. We have an egg cell from which the nucleus is removed. We'll fuse those cells together and grow that in culture to make a clone embryo. And if we're doing that for reproduction purposes, like to make a new animal, we would put that, that, uh, that um, embryo into a surrogate mother and allow it to develop to, to birth. If we're doing it for therapeutic cloning, in other words, to make cells that we might transfer to a person, let's say for gene therapy or something like that, then we would grow those, that embryo in tissue culture and then use those individual cells for the purpose that we, that we, that they're designed to, to be used for, whatever that happens to be. When we look at DNA profiles, remember we're looking at DNA sequences that, um, that are, that are produced by restriction analysis. We're looking at patterns on those gels. Okay, we can use them uh, to determine paternity, who the parents are of a of a person. Uh, if in the case of paternity, then all of the DNA bands from a child will match either the mother or the father's banding pattern. They won't be identical to to both parents or either parent, but they but all of the bands from each child will be found on either the father's uh, pattern or the mother's. If you're looking at a DNA profile from a crime scene, uh, think about what that means. When the suspect DNA matches the crime scene DNA, what does that prove? Does it prove the person did the crime? Or does it just prove that the person left their DNA there? Um, because it's, you know, proof is a different kind of thing. It's a really kind of a legal term. And so think about what that means in terms of actual evidence for, um, for a crime. Here are a couple of DNA profiles just to, just to, again, just to practice on or to review. So here's a child's DNA, and we're looking to make sure we know that this woman is the mother of the child, and we want to know if this man could be the father. And so when we look at each band from the child, that band matches the father, this band matches the mother, this band matches mother, this one matches father, this one matches mother, this one matches father. So every, even though there are bands present in the, in the father's DNA and in the mother's DNA that don't match up to the child, every band of the child's pattern matches either one from the father or one from the mother. In the crime scene, again, you're going to have an exact match if the suspect left that particular DNA there. But again, that may not prove that the, that person is guilty. It may just prove that they left their DNA at the crime scene. <clears throat> Lots of vocabulary, and so there's on the review sheet, there are vocabulary words. I've gone through some of the definitions here just for practice in case you need to write them down, so feel free to pause the video and, uh, and write these down as you need to. Biotechnology is the manipulation of living organisms or their components to make useful products. A clone is an organism or a molecule that is genetically identical to, a different, uh, to another one. The process of differentiation is, is how those unspecialized cells in an embryo become specialized to do specific jobs. Um, and so that's called differentiation. Genetic engineering is when we're directly manipulating genes for, what, for some practical purpose. Um, GMOs, genetically modified organisms, and that can be anything that's been transformed in some way or another like that, like, uh, in, like in genetic engineering, or it could be um, a, a plant that you, you're going to uh, grow for food crops that has been changed in some way to make it more easier to grow or to more nutritious or something like that. A mutation is any change in the nucleotide sequence may or may not change the function of the protein that, that the gene codes for, but there is a change there. A palindrome, remember, is a DNA sequence that reads the same backwards and forwards, and so be sure and look at uh, the examples of restriction enzymes that are in the notes and so forth, just to get a practice on, on identifying those things. PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction, and this is a way of increasing the size of the DNA sample. Like I said before, it's kind of like a Xerox machine for genes. A plasmid is a small separate ring of DNA that's separate from the main chromosome of the bacterium, and that's the part that we oftentimes manipulate in order to get bacteria to make products that we want them to make. Pluripotent stem cells are ones that are capable of becoming any type of specialized cell, as opposed to ones that are not able to make any kinds. There are some that are called unipotent that only make one kind of cell and so forth. 
Recombinant DNA is DNA that comes from two or more sources. So it could be, you know, um, it could be a bacterium that has a gene for making insulin. For instance, that would be recombinant DNA. Um, there are lots of examples that we talked about in the notes. Restriction analysis, looking at the DNA fragments cut by a restriction enzyme, pretty simple. <clears throat> the stem cell is an undifferentiated cell from which specialized cells arise. Uh, sticky ends are the unpaired nucleotide sequences resulting from a restriction enzyme. Transformation is incorporating a new, new genes into a cell from another source. And a transgenic organism is an organism containing genes from another species. On the review sheet, there is this diagram, and the diagram is on the test with some questions asked about it. And so I am on the review sheet. You don't have the answers to some of these. And so I uh, am purposely put this picture in here so that you can pause the video and make sure you are identifying the right things on the diagram on the review sheet. And that's the review for the Unit 15 test. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. You can ask in class or send me a message on Schoology. Um, I'll be glad to answer as much as I can. Um, be sure to look at the final exam schedule for the virtual students. Your exam will be on Wednesday. It will be open between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m., so make sure that you allow yourself the amount of time to take the test and have it finished and submitted before 4 o'clock. Those students on site, uh, your test will be uh, on Tuesday afternoon for first period and Thursday morning for seventh period, and we will see you soon. Good luck studying on your finals.